Oh, hello. You're uh, you're probably here about the uh, the story. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I have something to say. Can we just stick with the introduction of the guest? <sighs> Today, we welcome the author of I Have Something to Say, who will help you with all those holiday toasts, John Bo. Okay, but I just, I really wanted to say that... It's the headline. Just, just the headline. In our headlines, we talk about diversification, making year-end changes to your investments. This headline's for you. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Ricky, who thinks his mom is failing to maximize her legacy with IRAs. Wow, doesn't he know that mom's always right? And then I'll share some constitutional trivia. But I wanted to say... What did you want to say? I just wanted to say... And now, two guys who always have something to say about how you can stack more Benjamins... It's Joe and oh, j j j j g Happy Wednesday, stackers. Let me be the first one to welcome you. Grab a cup of your favorite beverage. Uh, hit that button on the Lazy Boy. Relax and get ready to cuddle up with some money fun. Man, we got a great Wednesday on Tap OG. Uh, just another fabulous day, but, uh, and who's counting days until my birthday? Maybe this guy. Maybe. But... <laughs> who's got two thumbs and is counting days to his own birthday? That guy. John Bowe's going to make us all better at these awkward discussions we seem to have at holiday parties, holiday events. If you're going to be giving a talk, now is the month, and especially if you feel like you're not great at public speaking, which I think is 99.9% of us, John <clears throat> Bo's here to help us all. <clears throat> <laughs> Are you the point one? Yeah. I'm the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> yeah. Two out of three money podcasters might feel like they need help in this area. The third <laughs> expresses gross overconfidence, but <laughs> we got a great headline first. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline comes to us from Financial Planning. This is a very thoughtful piece, OG, written by Aaron Brown. I was reading this at breakfast this morning. Listen to this. I think this is great for people that are, you know, making year-end changes to the portfolio. They're thinking about their investments, maybe starting to roll into their 2023 action plan. Aaron writes this headline, Diversifying volatility matters more than the number of stocks. He says researchers at financial advisory firm NDVR in Boston, Yin Chen and Roni Israeloff have come up with a new take on an age old question for investors. How many stocks should you own for a properly diversified portfolio? The academic approach to finding an answer goes back to a 1968 journal of finance paper by John Evans and Stephen Archer that included a graph where you can find versions of almost any introductory financial book and many personal finance articles. They concluded there was little additional diversification benefit once you got beyond 10 or 15. Well, this, this latest research OG says that largely it's not about the number of stocks. It's about finding things that don't correlate as much if you want to calm down the portfolio. This is, this, I think, big news for a lot of investors. Well, I think that you can add another like layer to this and recognize that since you don't know what stocks are going to outperform in any period of time, uh, Visual Capitalist had a really cool visualization of the S&P and all the stocks. Maybe we can include that in the newsletter. And it shows all of the stocks moving in each sector over the whole uh, you know year to date, basically. And you see, you know, some are up 100 percent, some are down 80 percent. You can't pick what stock's going to do well. You can't pick what sector's going to do well in advance. And so you need to have broad diversification across all different areas. And since you don't know what that looks like, I think it makes a really strong case for kind of owning one of just about everything because you're going to get that, that negative correlation, which is what you're looking for, or you know the opposite correlation. You want something to go down when other things go up. And it sounds really counterintuitive because you say, well, 
No, I want all of my portfolio to go up. No, you don't. If everything is going up at the same time, it's not, it's not diversified. And I think that's basically the point on the research here. Well, and the bad news about that, that people don't think about when everything's going up is that if it all goes up together, it's all going to go down together. That's not a right. fun time. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need something to, it's like those sine waves, you know, that you graphed in algebra, you need the opposite ones. You know, it's like Bose noise canceling headsets, you know, <laughs> right. the opposite that's sound, you need great, the opposite sound to make it, to make great the sound analogy. Go away. Yeah. That's cool. That technology, the way it works is awesome. We just gotta, yeah. we just gotta do the exact opposite and it'll shut it down. Uh, you know, it's funny because this even goes the OG beyond stocks. Like you can look at a diversified portfolios, having a little real estate in it. I know it's been a long time since I was a financial planner, but we would have a little bit of precious metals or maybe some natural resources in the portfolio. So even looking beyond stocks, if you're looking to be more diversified, might be a good idea. Uh, yeah. I mean, all of those things matter, right? Big companies and small companies, U.S.-based ones, non-U.S.-based ones, real estate, to some extent commodities, depending on how you hold them. You know, the companies that create the stuff out of the ground or get the stuff out of the ground, or are you trying to get the stuff, gold itself or something? And you can even see the diversifying effect of adding fixed income, which really has uh, traditionally anyway, a pretty decent uh, dampening of, of that roller coaster ride. Maybe not so much this year, but, but traditionally it does. And you know, that brings up something else. This is something a lot of people don't know, OG, which is that, and you've really opened my eyes to this, which a lot of people think if I have mid-sized companies and small companies, that those are diversified and you say, nay, nay. Well, first I would say, watch me whip. And then I would say, nay, nay. to watch me nay, nay. But yeah, I mean, and, and this is kind of an interesting use of data is on correlation because, I mean, you can do this with ETFs. You can do this with uh, stocks. You can do it with all sorts of mutual funds. And you'd be surprised how many times people are like, no, 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 I'm diversified. I've got Vanguard total market, Vanguard dividend growth, Vanguard growth and income, and Vanguard US large cap. And you go, yeah, that's all the same thing. No, it's not. Those are five different ones. I'm diversified. Doug, like you were saying, it's not about the number. It's about the quality of the thing that you have and how it relates to the other parts of the portfolio. Correlation is a measurement of how it's going to react with each other, right? So if this goes up, does it go up the same amount or more or less or whatever, or not at all? A lot of times people get kind of schnookered into that, basically, and say, well, I got five different funds. They're all diversified. An eye-opening piece of that is, you know, for me, many years ago was that mid-sized companies and small companies are the same in terms of correlation. There's, there's, no, there's no added benefit to having mid-sized companies in your portfolio from a diversification standpoint. I think it should have been horrifying uh, early this year when we did the headline about crypto and about how increasingly crypto was correlating to the stock market as it became more evident that people were investing in crypto as an investment and not as a currency, that when the stock market went down, crypto was going down. Now, since then, crypto has decided it would go down more than the stock market has. So it's kind of peeled off. But I think, I think OG, you make a great point that people have to be wary of and be on guard against uh, this, these ways they think they're diversifying that they truly aren't. Any other examples of that that you can think of? I think there's two. Two other examples that I hear a lot of. I think one of them is pretty self-explanatory. People say, well, I want to be diversified, so I have my money at Fidelity and at TD. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's, that, that has nothing to do with anything. It's irrelevant. You know, yeah, that's nothing. And the other one that I have a little bit of an issue with is when people say, I want to be diversified, so I bought a duplex. And, and I go, you bought a duplex, like one single piece of property in these United States, you know, like that's your diversification strategy is one thing. A diversifying effect of real estate wouldn't be to buy one property. It would be to buy a real estate investment trust, you know, which has lots of properties in it or something like that. I think there's probably some effect on the single family, one purchase type of thing, but I haven't dug into it enough, but I suspect that if you're saying, how do I think one investment will do one particular you know, house on one street versus you know, the 500 biggest companies in the United States, I think I would say 
I don't think it's having the effect that you think it is. <laughs> that's, what, well, that's what I would think. Yeah, we're not saying don't buy the duplex. Just if you're after diversification, no. that's not what you're getting. You're getting concentration, yeah, yeah, yeah. and your portfolio will go inordinately the way that one thing goes versus – you know, an equal size of money that's diversified amongst a bunch right, of stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. We will dive more into diversification, a very interesting piece here. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. And OG, as you said, we're going to dive deeper. Brooke Miller, uh, who has worked with some of the richest people in America during her stint as a financial planner. She now writes the majority of our 201 where we do deeper dives. It's our free newsletter, stackybedjamins.com slash 201. And that comes out the day after the show. Coming up next, John Bo joins us. John had this experience in his family that he could not fathom, which was the biggest introvert in his life that he knew by far. Person was much more than an introvert. Everybody in the family thought he was introverted to the point that he was very, very, people called him weird. And then he announced one day that he was getting married. And as the least li likely person in his family to have a relationship with anybody, how did this relative do that? How did he have this very, very intimate interpersonal relationship? And this led John to talk about communication. And if we're going to be communicating at all, which we do a heck of a lot in December, uh, this is a great story. And he's going to walk us through how to be a better communicator this month, whether it's at the company party, the family event where you're dealing with relatives you don't talk to very much, or you're asked to give a toast or a speech. John Bow up next. But before that, Doug, I think you've got some trivia for us, man. That's right, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I have something else I want to say. Now, come on. You're, okay, you're going to get a turn. Let's just do the trivia. Fine. On this day in 1787, the first state ratified the Constitution joining the United States of America. Wait a minute. Is it joining? If you're like the only one? If you're the anyway... This state, also known as the Small Wonder, I know what that's like, accepted the Constitution unanimously with the 30 delegates in their Constitutional Convention. My question is, which state was it? I'll be right back after I go register this LLC. stackers i'm basement d ratifier joe's mom's neighbor doug the constitution was actually signed four months before this state ratified it but philadelphia just had terrible wi-fi so which state was the first to ratify the constitution delaware and now to help you declare your message we welcome john bow And John Bo joins us. How are you? I am all right today. It's sunny. And even though the day is about six hours long at this time of year, it's sunny. That's all I care about. I know. What's funny is Cheryl, my spouse, and I went on a walk uh, yesterday, a very nice walk. It was a beautiful afternoon in Texarkana. And she said, you know, what's funny is it's it's maybe five in the afternoon. You can feel the the end coming to the day already. But we're still not close to the shortest day of the year, John. Still coming. Some friends of mine 20 years ago started celebrating a winter eclipse. Winter, sorry, not eclipse, but winter solstice party. Oh, awesome. And I understand why the pagans and everybody way back in the day <laughs> celebrated that day. Because it's like you're heading into the gloom and then you pass that day and things are getting better. Even if it's still cold, you at least know this is not getting any worse. Well, and you know what? We are way off topic now. But I do want to say this while we're on this. This is why I think... You know, go ahead and take down your holiday ornamentation, except those outdoor lights. I think those outdoor lights just make these gloomy January, February days so nice. We should start a tradition. I heard that in Scandinavian countries, they kind of do this more. Keep the lights on all winter long. I spent one winter upstate New York all by myself in a big, huge house surrounded by 90 acres. And I went around the bend that winter. And being in New York City with all the lights, it does this fake thing. It yeah. tells... Your little lizard brain, like, okay, there's something good happening here. Well, let's tell people there. I think lizard brain is a great transition, John, because we're going to holiday parties this year. We're meeting with bosses or influential people we want to meet with. And we may be freaking out a little bit because 
I may have to say something to somebody, right? Our heart beats faster and our lizard brain goes, oh God, no, let's not go or let's not make an impression, but that's the wrong, that's the wrong thing. So I want to, I want to start off actually where you start off because you begin in the book. I don't think I've ever started an interview this way, by the way, you start off with a quote from Walt Whitman. And I want you to explain to us why this is where you start the book. You say, I'm larger and better than I thought. I do not think I held so much goodness. Why this Whitman quote to kick off your book? I am so glad you reminded me of that quote because I forgot that I put it in the book. (laughs) And it really means a lot to me. Okay, when we can't speak well in public, when we're shy or socially anxious or shut down or whatever, no one gets to know you. No one gets to know all the good stuff that you have in you. So my take on public speaking and learning how to do it better is it releases and expresses all the parts of you that would otherwise be tamped down and choked back. I feel like we need this reminder, too, that just because I can't speak well today doesn't make me a bad person. It just means it's a skill that I don't yet have. Oh, it's I've got a whole thing about this. I mean, we think that it's a mental illness or a product of our character. I'm socially anxious. I'm shy. I'm an introvert. And we have no idea that it's a skill like cooking or being a doctor or flying a plane you know, that you can learn how to do. It has very little to do with your personality. Well, you have, in your family, you have the probably supreme example of this, John. (laughs) You talk about this person. We podcast, as you know, from my mom's basement. So we we talk about fun it is being in mom's basement. You have a step cousin who lived in mom's basement way, way, way longer than most people I know. A guy named Bill Von Huntsdorf, if I pronounce that right. Okay, I never had anything to do with public speaking. I wasn't an expert. I wasn't good at it. I never wanted to be. And I interviewed him for a different project. He was a step cousin of our family, my stepmother's cousin from Iowa. And he lived in rural Iowa, and he was known as Weird Cousin Bill. And he had lived in his parents' basement building model train sets and learning to play the piano for 60 years, just about. He had never kissed anyone and never held hands with anyone, never gone to a bar and had a beer with his pal. And then he got married. And so everyone in the family chuckled about it and wondered how did this bizarre, (laughs) profound transformation take place. So later when I grew up and I became a journalist and I could interview anyone, you know, and just knock on anyone's door and ask him, what's your story? I asked him, how in the hell did you go from being a guy who wears black socks up to your knees and talk to your future wife for the first time. Well, that's easy. The, expected... the, the black socks, John, is easy. He's German. True, 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 <laughs> I guess. Still, though, this was it after the age when people stopped right. wearing those pretty much. I think the memo had gone out largely. Anyway, I just expected that he had gone to therapy or started taking meds or something like that had changed him. And he surprised me by saying, I joined Toastmasters and they taught me how to do public speaking and it changed my life. We are more connected. I mean, Bill's not alone. And I love that you start with that story, John, because we are more connected than ever before. But you point out that we're lonelier than ever before. That was really the kind of stuff that fueled my interest in the book is long time ago, the Greeks invented democracy. And then five minutes later, they invented public speaking lessons because their idea wasn't even an idea. It's like a necessity. If you have a world where people need to talk to each other, they need to be taught to talk to each other. So I don't think at the time they thought of it as the skill of connecting. But then later, another teacher came along named Cicero, who was the best teacher of public speaking of all time. And he called it the art of connection. And so they taught this in school. It was the main subject that anybody with a higher education received for years and years of training. Here's how you connect with people. Here's how you argue with people. And then two or 300 years ago, we decided it was super uncool because it wasn't scientific and we trashed it. And so everything that I teach is reviving this old Greek and Roman teaching. It's super simple. It's not profound, but it's like, how do I connect with people? And that brings up my question, which is that if we're so well connected, why do we feel so lonely? Is it because now we can see people that are actually good at this trait, that they maybe have practice it or they're somehow naturally gifted and we compare ourselves to those people. So instead of getting out there and mixing it up with people online, which should make it easier than ever, John, to communicate, we just decide not to connect. Is that why? 
That's a really interesting question. And I guess it gets it the definition of connect, right? You and I can connect here with this amazing technology that lets us connect between New York City and Texarkana. And I have business people I work with in India and Spain and California all over. But it's really like a thinking thing, right? That's the technology side of it, but there's the thinking thing. So I'm thinking about Joe. What does Joe need? What is Joe focusing on? You know what I mean? Do you need money? Do you need love? Do you need help with your startup? Do you need yes, help with your all the above. kids? <laughs> <laughs> so, so for any interaction with you, I've got to show up thinking about your perspective. Is it morning for you? Is it nighttime? Are you in a hurry? Are you on a diet? Are you, you know what I mean? I just, it's this way of thinking about other people for a little bit before you talk to them so that you align. And I think that if we're not taught a bit about this in school, we don't get to connect with people well and we find social interactions frustrating and we decide that they're not great or I'm not great at it, so therefore I shouldn't do it. And really, it's just this technical skill that we're grasping for but missing. So for Bill, I mean, I'm just trying to put one and one together here for people, John. Bill says he went to Toastmasters, which people think of these community groups where you learn to give speeches. But what he said he really learned wasn't about giving speeches. It was about connecting with people, which I think we see as something separate, right? But, but, but truly isn't as separate as we think it is. My cousin joined Toastmasters. I should define Toastmasters for anybody who doesn't oh, that's good. Yeah. know what they're. It's this global uh, nonprofit group devoted to teaching the art of public speaking. So you join them. It costs almost nothing. And it's just done by your peers. You do these exercises. And people evaluate each other and you learn pretty quickly and in a very supportive environment how to speak about anything you want to talk about. So anyway, Bill joined Toastmasters and the main thing that he learned was how to stop thinking about himself so much and to start thinking about the person or the people he's talking to. And that right there is the key to everything. It's so funny how much these uh, discussions with people like you begin to intersect we talked to Carmine Gallo uh, recently who wrote Talk Like Ted, but we interviewed him for a book about Bezos and the way Bezos has learned to write. And John, he said that the problem with people writing is that you start off by trying to tell everybody you're smart. So you use a bunch of big words. Instead, you should start with your person you're writing to and how do they get the message? You're saying it's the same exact thing that Bill went through to start communicating the point that he got married. It's exactly the same thing. I was saying something to my sister about a month ago, and I didn't know that I was saying anything, but I said the biggest single cause of bad public speaking is the desire to seem smart. And if you flip that around to make it easier to understand, you could say the biggest thing that drives bad public speaking is the fear of seeming dumb. So if I began to talk to you today, Joe, by using a bunch of big words or by telling you my life story or by telling you about how smart I am or all of my professional accomplishments instead of just talking about what we're talking about, or if I were an architect, for example, and I'm doing a presentation to try to sell a project, and I bring 150 slides of all my great work to show you how great I am, or if I'm a financial person, and I show you 18,000 stats and graphs and da 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 instead of just talking to you like a person and saying, Joe, this is a great investment because I think these people are psyched and they're brilliant, let's go. I mean, which one are you going to hear better? Which one is more tailored yeah. to you? Yeah, obviously, number two, by far. A lot of it is just keeping it simple. Be real, be simple. Get to the point. Don't go off into some weird way of talking that you would never use to talk to normal people. I love this idea, though, in Toastmasters that there are these basics that get in all of our way, right? And the thing I love about this project, John, is that you you made yourself the guinea pig. You went to Toastmasters meetings. So walk us through... For those of us that haven't been there, uh, walk us through what happened at your first Toastmasters meeting. How does that go? I had to edit my tone and my writing about that first meeting so many times to take away the squirreliness and the just contempt. I had just contempt for myself and for the process and for everybody. I, I was so nervous. I was so anxious and I was you compensating. Wrote, you actually wrote in the final draft that I read, you wrote that you said you thought it was really dorky when you first walked in. I mean, not only just dorky, but I just 
Boy, I can't really begin to express how uncomfortable I felt. If you feel uncomfortable at different times when you do public speaking, if you put yourself in a place where the sole focus is public speaking and looking at you and giving you full attention and making you better at it, the amount of social anxiety was just multiplied by 100. And so everything they did, I was just, my knee-jerk response was to be critical of it to hate it, to feel like, well, this isn't necessary. This isn't how I would do it. It was just me, 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 me. And I felt miserable until I got a certain ways into it, like the third or fourth speech exercise. Then I finally started to chill out and trust the method. And then I realized, oh, this is brilliant. This is one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. But, you know, you read books like by immersive journalists who go to Antarctica and live for a year and do all these things. I swear to God, this that would have been a vacation compared to this. <laughs> well, so tell me, so what happens? You walked in the door. What happens? Well, they have you do these things which are pretty prescribed. Like, if you want to sit in a Toastmasters meeting and say nothing for a year, you can do that. They will let you do that. No one's going to force you to speak. It's very, very gentle and welcoming. But I was there to write a book. I had to force myself to start engaging quickly. You know, time was money in that situation. So... They go through certain motions, like they have a word of the week, and then they have the humor part of the club session, right? And you can stand up and tell a joke or watch other people stand up and tell a joke. And so you're not looking at Dave Chappelle here, right? We're, <laughs> these are amateur people, most of whom have social anxiety. So they are standing up and telling maybe a kind of bad joke. And so if you're looking at it like a critic thinking, well, I've seen much better comics on Netflix then yeah, it falls short of an entertaining experience. But later I realized these people are just working on how do you stand up? How do you look around the room? How do you introduce your topic in a way that isn't bananas? And how do you tell a completed story from beginning to end? And that's not nothing, you know, that's actually a bunch of check marks you got to check off to do well. And I want to stop right there for everybody, because if you're like me and you're going to a company meeting, like back in the days when I was with American Express, I was smart enough, John, that I would go in with a list of people I wanted to say hi to. My heart would beat a thousand miles an hour while I'm walking up to them. I'm thinking about exactly what I'm going to say. And initially I would step in it. And, and to realize, I think that these people in this room are just like me and they're just learning to control their heartbeat, to look around, to take these pauses, to do these things so that this connection can actually happen is a pretty, it's actually a pretty powerful thing. I would think once you get used to the fact that, that it's all pretty wooden, like I've been to, I was in Toastmaster for a while. It feels really wooden, like very, very wooden. Like we're just working on the structure of speaking. I have about five responses to that. One of them is we all have this knee jerk feeling that if it doesn't feel comfortable for me, it must be bad. It must be inauthentic. And that idea of authenticity is a really big one. People feel like learning how to speak or prepping the way you speak or rehearsing it or thinking about it at all is really, really inauthentic and that that's bad and it's fake. So to that, I would say not being able to be warm, not being able to say what you want to say, that's inauthentic too. And so you have a choice, which way is better? And I would rather connect with people, even if that means I've got to think about what I'm going to say a little bit. Like, when I was younger, and I mean up until just a few years ago, my attitude was wing it always. Anybody who doesn't wing it 100% of the time is a loser and a faker, and I'm really cool because I wing it all the time. And I, I realized that's just not true. I've blown it on many occasions because I didn't prepare, and I, didn't, I was so dumb I didn't even know that you're supposed to prepare. We're talking about small talk for the holidays, and what does that have to do with public speaking? And I would say it's a form of public speaking. And so you prepare, like the first thing to get into your head is that it's a thing. You can prepare for it. You can think for a few seconds about the person you're going to talk to. And instead of just thinking about yourself and how nervous you are or how uncool you feel this is, or boy, this is wooden, or God, is this forced, or God, is this terrible that we're not going to talk about the deepest things in life right now. I would just say, like, think about the moment, be present be intentional. I'm talking to my Uncle Joe here. I haven't seen him for a while. I heard he lost his wife last year. I heard he had a baby last year. 
whatever, just think about it for a second and get ready to talk to people instead of just barging in and saying, uh, hey, and hoping that that works well. Yeah, it, no, it's it, there's there's so much. I mean, you go over the fact that uh, uh, this idea of being prepared, there's a gentleman who's in prison and this guy's name is Ray. I think it's pronounced uh, Chenier or Chenier. Uh, uh, Roy was had a chance to finally get paroled and he went to Toastmasters. And what, what was he in for? I think it was seven weeks, you say seven months or seven weeks. Um, not in for that long. I'll tell this whole story. Roy Chenier was a guy I interviewed who at 17 years old, he had, you know, was raised in a bad neighborhood in Baton Rouge and at 17 got convicted for 99 years for a burglary that he partook in. And uh, after about 20 years, they started giving him parole hearings and he would blow it every time. And when I interviewed him, he was a very charismatic, normal, easygoing guy. But he said, anytime I had to speak to people with a little bit of power, I would lose it and I would just stop being able to speak. So that's a perfectly baked in situation for bad parole hearings. And now can you imagine you're talking for your life, your ability to public speak is the thing that's going to give you your freedom or not. And he would blow it. He'd get up there in front of the judges and they'd ask him these very hard questions like, what is your worth to society? What are you going to do besides crimes? Why should we let you go? And he would just stare at the ground after blowing the first answer and just think, oh, God, I got to get out of here. I can't do this. I can't do this. And they would say, dismissed. You're denied your freedom for another two years. And this went on two years and then two more years and then two more years. And he just kept rotting away in jail until this buddy of his said, dude, you got to join the prison Toastmasters chapter. And so he joined. And seven months later, he was walking out of jail free man because six months later, after joining Toastmasters, he had a parole hearing and he looked at the judges and he answered their questions straight on. It wasn't like he didn't know the answer before. It's just he didn't know how to deliver the answer. And what's great about that, John, is that once you get used to these basics, it becomes second nature then. And so then you can focus on the connection. It's not as, to your point, prepping isn't as much about being a shyster or being bad it's about being able to focus on the thing that matters, which is the connection with the parole judge, right? He just has to be able to connect with them. And the only way I can do it is if I get these basics out of the way. Can we, with the limited time that we have, I want to give people some tactical stuff that you learned at Toastmasters. And I think there were, there were three big basics that people learn almost from day one when they go to Toastmasters. First of all, if you could talk about this, work on the start of your talk and the end of your talk ahead of time. Can you talk about that for a moment? Let me back up because because people really don't know how many technical components go into good public speaking. One really good first thing to do, and maybe this is less appropriate for small talk, but more appropriate for more formal presentations, say yeah. hi. Oh, say yeah. Say hi. You would not believe how many people start a speech by saying, okay, today I'm going to talk about our Q4 results and da, 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 da. And they don't even stop for a moment to say like, hey, y'all, you know, thanks for giving me your time today. That's all. That's all you need. Or, hey, everybody, I hope you're having a good afternoon. It's actually funny because when I first was on uh, television talking uh, and I had been through Toastmasters, I'd had PR training. We were talking about uh, Kmart and laying off a bunch of people before they went bankrupt, but they were laying off a bunch of people. It was a very serious topic, John. So I came on, I was very somber. I was on a panel of people. I was very somber. I was very doom and gloom because it's definitely a doom and gloom moment in people's life. You know, the feedback I got from our PR firm that was helping me get better at this, I needed to smile at the beginning. They said, I could be somber later, but the audience wants to like you and appreciate you. And if you smile and you kind of say, even to a TV camera, if you say hi to them and say, thank you for having me to the host and smile and then get doom and gloom later, you seem much more approachable. Isn't that wild? Like the... the I it's almost, I always compare it, and I don't think I do a very good job of this, but I compare it to two different computer networks. There's that thing for anyone who's a tech geek called the handshake, right? Two different network protocols need to have a handshake where they understand each other and they lock in together. And then the data can flow between the networks. And I feel like when people speak, they need a beat. It's not just to like you. I think that that's, that gets passed around as being the thing that makes 
public speaking go well. I don't think they have to like you. I don't think you have to be phony, but you do have to give them a moment where you recognize them and just say like, oh, you're humans and you have a consciousness and you we're here and I have a consciousness and now we're going to talk. Just a beat of that, you know? I don't think it's weird. I don't think it's phony. But anyway, this is th- the beginning. This is the beginning of the speech. And the other thing I learned, by the way, John, from PR training is that you can feel your heartbeat at the beginning. And if you sit there for a second and just say hi and let them react, it also helps you gain a little bit of control, get a little composure because nobody can hear your heartbeat but you, which I had to be reminded of about 97,000 times. If you look at the, I think it's still the most watched TED Talk of all time, or maybe it's in the top five or something like that. And it's this English educator talking about how we have to make education more creative to serve our kids of today. He shambles up to the mic and he spends like the first 90 seconds of his talk just saying like, hey, everybody, isn't this great to be here? I've just heard so many great TED Talkers. We're learning a bunch of interesting stuff. He's not coming on strong and hitting you over the head with his intellectual educational policy. He's just like, hey, and I think that's a really instructive case. Now, anyway, you asked about some of these technical things from Toastmasters. Yeah, beginning and the end. Okay, so one thing that Toastmasters suggests, or at least people suggested to me, was memorize the beginning and the end of your speech. If you can't memorize anything else, memorize the first couple lines and the last couple lines. So then when you're in a socially anxious situation and your brain goes AWOL and you suddenly can't command 50% of your brain to do what you want it to do, those things will stay in place. If you practice it out loud a couple of times, you'll get this muscle memory that will really stay in place even if the rest of your brain leaves you. And if you memorize the ending of your speech or presentation or whatever it is, then even in the fog of giving it, you'll have this sort of fog light to focus on, you know, a lighthouse kind of. It'll you'll you'll know where you're heading and you'll be able to get there. You'll be able to paddle the boat or whatever's the right metaphor here just to get to the end of what you're saying without losing it. And the East German judge likes you if you stick the landing, right? It's everybody. Think of think of when gymnasts or figure skaters end with that perfect ending. Yeah. And yeah. they don't jiggle around. You're like, damn, you nailed it. Wow. And then if you think about all the public speakers who end a presentation or a speech by saying, uh, like they're surprised that they got to the end. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, no. So I guess, yeah, that, I guess that's pro- that's it. You just somehow vaporize, I'm guessing, I'm making this up, but like 30% of people's takeaway, you just somehow blew it up by not ending on an authoritative note. Now, you could say that's phony or it's dumb, but that's the way it is. If somebody ends on a faltering note, just your take, the people's takeaway of you is that person. The, yeah, no, okay, so, well, yeah, that's their takeaway. This comes directly from the Greeks, too. I mean, this is in Toastmasters. This is end well, right? Uh, next up is uh, break your story up into three or four parts. Toastmasters is very big on this. The Greeks didn't care about this stuff and the Romans, but modern, everybody who talks about whether it's jokes or stories, and it's also in Toastmasters, almost everybody breaks things into three these days. I think that that's overemphasized, but still three or four or five, not eight, not 14. You know, tell people before you're going to speak, and this is more, you know, of a formal presentation than a small talk moment, but just say, hey, Joe, today I want to talk about public speaking. I'm going to talk about these three different things. First, I'll talk about this. Then I'll talk about this. Then I'll talk about that. And then as you're going through, you say, okay, now I just finished up my first thing. Now I'm going to talk about my second thing. And then you say the same with the third. And then at the end, you recap. And that sounds really like too much work and why do you need to be so repetitive? And that's because if you compare it to a book, we all have this visual language for understanding where we are in a book. Table of contents, section breaks, chapter headings. And with speaking, people need similar, you know, markings to know where they are in the process of your speech. So you're not just babbling at them. And if you give them those little pauses and little indications and kind of a roadmap and let them know where they are in the whole thing, they can listen more easily. I love that. The idea that a speech is a lot like the old five paragraph essay we learned in high school too. you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you're to tell them and then tell them what you told them. Like it's a nice way to, I think to think about that beginning, middle end as well. All of that stuff comes from Cicero 
the guy I mentioned before, who was the best, most popular teacher of public speaking in history, he wrote a book about 150 AD that was, so public speaking and rhetoric was the number one subject in education until the 1700s in the West. And his book on public speaking was the number one book for 15 centuries. So imagine anyone today writing a book that's going to be that central to people's life and education for 15 centuries. He was the one who came up with that composition exercise. It just feels like a hidden skill, John. Like it's right in front of us, this treasure chest, that if we can pop the lock on it like Bill did, not only will we get married or we'll get out of jail, like we will just connect so much. And we talk all the time on this show about how a lot of your success is who you surround yourself with. Your ability to do those things is going to be much bigger. I want to bring up the last one here, which is the one that I remember most from Toastmasters, John, get rid of the crutch words. And it's amazing how many crutch words we all have. Oh, think of how many words we say that aren't necessary. So um, if uh, every uh, you know third or fourth word I say is ah, uh, because I'm buying uh, time to think of the, uh, the next thing. So what I really want to say is, and like, so maybe 10, 20, 30% of people's words are empty calories. And if you force yourself to slow down, you can really eliminate all of those words. Now, all of this comes back to don't think about yourself, think about your audience. Because for me, if I talk like this, I feel a little bit robotic. But for you listening to me, it's way less cognitive work because you're not having to digest those 30% of the words and syllables I'm saying that mean nothing and convey nothing. And it actually gives your buffer, your listening buffer, a little more time to refill. So you understand me. You think, boy, that John is a really straight shooter, really intentional guy. He's not just messing around, uh, 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 thinking on the spot, like uh, wasting my time, you know. So of all the different public speaking things, that's one of the easier ones to solve for. Because if you get people to slow down and just trust that they won't look crazy if they actually focus only on the words they're trying to say. Well, how do you get rid of that? If you don't go to Toastmasters, I'm listening to you because in Toastmasters, they count those words and it's horrifying as they count up how many I had. And I went from, I think the number was a gazillion. I think I set some club record where I was <laughs> and, and then you went to zero. And by the way, at the end, and you might've done this the same way, John, I came back to my family that night and I talked like a robot I, I totally talked like a robot after we're, after I got out of that Toastmasters meeting. But how do you do it? Do you record yourself uh, talking out loud? Joe, earlier you said it's surprising how many of these things, you know, they seem wooden and they seem difficult at first and they make you self-conscious when you learn them. But then very quickly they become second nature. This is one of those, but even more than the other things. So you go to Toastmasters and like you said, they have the ah counter at the end of the meeting. And if it's Joe, you had two ahs and ums. And, you know, Mary, she had three. And then Johnny, you had 82 of them. <laughs> you just, you feel so ashamed. I think for most people, that only has to happen a couple times before you develop this new brain region that is paying attention to that stuff and really just forcing you to pay attention. You know, it's like if you started dating someone new and they told you that it wasn't cool that you show up with body odor and that there's a relatively easy fix for that you would learn how to take showers before your dates pretty quickly. It wouldn't require years of therapy. So the skill, and it doesn't, I tell people to do it and they don't necessarily have to go to Toastmasters. They just have to pay more attention to how gross it sounds when they have like, um, um, like, you know, so much like um, filler um, content in like, a, you know, much, so much more or less of, of what they're saying. They can edit it out pretty quickly quickly. I haven't seen anyone really struggle with that, which is shocking. But but it's also powerful, right? That at the end of your first meeting, I know you were horrified and you felt down and like, man, I'm not going to get this. As a guy who communicated already a lot, John, you felt bad, but by meeting five or six, you really felt like you were made some progress. I was shocked by how hard it was. And I was shocked by how quickly I made progress once. But the big, big breakthrough was really separating my speech ability from my personality. I went in there 100% convinced that this is all about my personality. And after two or three meetings, I realized this is about a technique. And that technique begins with thinking of the poor person who has to listen to you. 
instead of thinking about your poor anxiety and your poor self. And that's the key to everything. The book is called I Have Something to Say. It's fabulous. Walks through not just John's experience, but all of these techniques that we discussed today and even more. We just talked about, frankly, chapter one. Uh, John, John, we get the book everywhere, I assume, right? Yeah, there's this new startup called Amazon. I, <laughs> Never, is that going to be a I thing? Predict great, <laughs> I predict great things for them. They've got it. You can get it directly from the publisher and keep the publishing industry alive. Sounds like they're having a parade about your book behind you as well, like sirens. It's and New York City. There's always a parade. Oh, yeah. But this is about this interview, I'm sure. I'm sure it is about <laughs> it's the fire truck corps coming through to give you a shout out. That's right. Yeah. Available everywhere. John, thanks for hanging out, making us all better speakers today. I appreciate it. No, thank you for having me on the show, Joe. It was fun. Hey, this is Jen Pilcher, Navy spouse of 23 years. And when I'm not helping military spouses connect in our digital community, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to John Bowe. And you know what, OG? I think he has a point. We talk about financial literacy not being taught in schools. We also talked with Tracy McCubbin about the fact that we don't understand media sales strategies that, that are just all over us now, Right. We bring all this stuff into our house because we don't have any training against it. John makes an equal argument, I think, about the idea that you think you're a bad speaker. You think you were just born that way. Well, we were all born that way. We don't practice it. And here we have 11 and some odd years of us practicing it. And uh, you might say we've got a lot of filler words. <laughs> you know what? I, I go back, though, and I listen to those episodes from the early days. And it's true, this, you know, constant drumbeat of do it, do it, do it, do it. The shows are sharper. Yeah. Our ability to cut to the chase, I think, is a lot better. Uh, you just got to get out there and practice it. Practice it out loud, but. Filler words. You brought in a whole filler character. That's true. <laughs> have, you, have you gone to, have you, have either of you guys gone to Toastmasters? Once. Have not. Yeah. Uh, uh, Doug, you know, John was horrified when he went the first time and he was like, Oh God, this is not for me. And yeah. it was just super hard. And like he said in the interview, he thought it was dorky. Did you think the same thing when you went that time? Uh, but well, and I know every chapter is a little different and so much depends on who the, you know, yeah, these are not <laughs> professional people. Right. Well, right. So Mine felt a little cultish. The one that I went to felt a little too like they were trying to sell me on something and I just, it didn't. Like eyes wide shut cultish or? <laughs> right. No, well, they, yeah. they are trained every time they talk. The talk OG is, hey, how did you like it? Would you like to join us? Like, how would you like? Would you like I mean, mm. I felt that too. I was like, how would you like some of the Kool-Aid? Yeah. Just come grab your Kool-Aid. It's right over here. But that is, it is part of the learning to look somebody, what they're doing though, Doug, which is funny is they are actually training to learn to sell, right? To, 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 because you're always selling yourself. You're selling a message, you're selling you. And you're right. It creates a creepy ass vibe. Cause, cause I, I had that happen to me too. I don't think we're doing a great job of selling Toastmasters right now. No, but, but, but I stuck with it like John did. And I will tell you, I get exactly where he, he was going and I am going to go back after this interview. I, I looked up our local chapter in Texarkana and I'm not doing talks for fees, but I think this practice, the sharpening, sharpening the saw a couple times a month, I think is a, I think it's a good thing. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, guys, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. But right now, snow tires. Hey, OG, how do you feel about snow tires? I feel like they're not important. Yeah, <sighs> pretty irrelevant. Yeah, until you guys get walloped. It's like every three years you guys get walloped with some big thing. It's like an ice storm and the whole city shuts down. OG, how do you feel about not having snow tires during that one week every third year? <laughs> I think I'll make it. We have the snow <laughs> shovel argument again, like two weeks later. I feel yeah. like we're, we're on repeat. It's your loved ones in your time, guys. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. What you'll find when you get there, they have fantastic customer service. They've gotten rid of all those filler questions. John talked about filler words. It's all these questions they either know the answer to or that are irrelevant that aren't going to be part of the decision. Haven Life has taken it, made it a much quicker. It's all online. In most cases, you get an instant 
cover its decision. The cool thing is, is you're not being insured by some company that just started. You're being insured by Mass Mutual, their parent company, which is a 160-year-old insurer. StackyBenjamins.com slash Haven Life. What a great holiday gift that is. Uh, gift to us in this show is we get to throw out the lifeline to Ricky. Say hi, Ricky. Hey, Joe, OG, and Doug. Got a question for you. My mom is 68 and retired with a pension and social security that easily covers her living expenses and has no debt. She also has an IRA with nearly $2 million, but wants to leave all of it as inheritance, including her RMDs as gifts. But her IRA has over 50% in bonds, which is killing me. I know this would traditionally work for someone who needs more security with less volatile bond returns in retirement, but if she doesn't need the money and wants to leave as much as possible for inheritance, Shouldn't she be invested 100% in S&P 500 index funds to take advantage of the market rebound and keep stacking the Benjamins? Also, any tips for managing her RMDs as gifts besides giving cash or reinvesting in a brokerage account would be helpful. Looking forward to the shirt. Do you think Doug can sign it for me? Well, the bad news is, Ricky, Doug would have to sign the code that uh, we get from Brad because you get to... Hold on. I've got a real fan here. Yes. Can't we make this happen? <laughs> I've got a raving fan. Oh, boy. There has to be a way. Ricky, he will steal your shirt. So we're just going to send you a code. God, your shirt you may never show Damn up. It. Yes. StackyBenjamins.com slash voicemail, by the way, if you've got a question for us as well. And, and Ricky, thanks for a great question. You know, it's funny, OG. I want to pivot back to the beginning of this episode. We talked about diversification, some of the ways people step in it. This is a place where a lot of people step in it. You see people making the mistake that Ricky's mom's making. She's got this portfolio diversified as if she needs it, not really diversified with the end in mind. Yeah. The only thing that I would be concerned about is with pension and Social Security, obviously Social Security gets a little bit of a uh, cost of living adjustment. There's some chance that that, that pension doesn't. And there could be some time in the future where mom might need some of that IRA money to kind of help offset the rising costs, healthcare costs and so on and so forth later on in life. So I don't know that you necessarily want to just kind of carte blanche go, well, this is never going to be for mom because there are some scenarios where she might actually need it. Long-term care coverage or something like that, assisted care could get pretty expensive in a hurry. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But I think that when it comes to investing it, whether it's for yourself or for kind of the next generation, if that's what she's thinking about, yeah, you got to you got to consider the time horizon. You got to consider the time frame of the purpose of the money. You know, if you need the money in the next five years, it should be really conservative. If you need it in the next 20 years, it should be pretty invested in equities. I know he said, shouldn't it all be in the S&P? Eh, I mean, I get what you're saying. Should it be invested in stock versus fixed income? Yes. All S and P probably not. You want to sprinkle in some other, you know, some some other diversification there, like we were talking about. But I would be supportive of that, assuming that we've run some calculations to see what mom's needs might look like. As far as the required distributions go, there's really not much you can do to manage it, except again, from a planning standpoint, thinking about what it looks like today and trying to plan for it four years in advance. Things like Roth conversions or um, Taking distributions now, using some of that money for charitable contributions will help offset those required distributions as well, depending on how mom feels about that. But you have to take the money out. So you can't just say, well, I don't need it, so I'm not going to do it. That's uh, that's going to be a requirement. It's kind of a double-edged sword. You save your whole life, you know, get all this money built up, you do the right thing, and then you turn 70 and go, and the government goes, cool, we need you to take out $70,000 right now. Like, but I don't need $70,000. So we don't care. You've, 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 you've gone long enough without paying taxes. It's time to start paying taxes. And every year that number increases to the point where when you're in your nineties, you're taking out almost 12% of the portfolio value every year as RMDs. So it's a really big, important thing to, to start working on in terms of kind of your strategy around that for sure. Yeah. This is more about your uncle wanting to finally get paid than it is about you. It's, yeah. it's time. Knock uncle, on the door. Your uncle Sam. Yep. N nothing to do with you. I got a question. When you talk about mom's needs, let's say that Ricky and his mom are looking at her financial plan and she has enough over 
that's that's invested uh, in a way that she gets income. So they truly don't need it. You said what mom's needs are. Do we then look at the individual beneficiaries, OG, and we kind of look at when they would need the money, like how many years out they are until they need the money and then invest it according to the beneficiaries need? Well, sure. But I mean, if you think if mom's 68 right now, I mean, you have to assume that she's going to live for another, you know, 20 or 25 years you know, assuming kind of normal life expectancy and health and that sort of thing. So I don't know that there's a big difference between investing for somebody that has a 20 year time horizon and somebody that has a 40 year time horizon. Yeah. I think okay. it's pretty similar. And the next question I had was around gift giving. Let's say that she has enough where clearly she's going to, she could double her lifestyle and she's still going to have more yep. than enough money. What about the idea of giving gifts when she's alive? Uh, so that she gets to watch her beneficiaries enjoy it now instead of missing out on all this, right? Right, yeah. So there's lots of estate planning techniques to kind of lower the value of your estate in the present day, right? So you can give a certain amount every year without filing any tax forms. There's amounts that you can do that are above it, and you just have to file a tax form. You don't need to be scared about it. You just need to know what you're getting yourself into and what that looks like. So between distribution planning, RMD planning, the tax stuff, the gifting, this probably isn't a DIY project. You probably want to find an estate planning attorney to kind of help walk you through this to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And I also think, I guess, as I was thinking through that question, I asked about gift giving. It also might be still a little early. I mean, so many things can happen with the market. You know, recession may deepen. You might have all of these problems that come up that we can't predict. With a lot of life left, to your point, she's still pretty young. Well, I mean, if if you look at the average cost, for example, of a long-term care stay right now, assisted care, right? You mm. just need some help getting around or you need help, you know, making sure that the house is taken care of or, you know, you take your medicine on time, you know, that sort of stuff happens. The average cost right now is somewhere in the neighborhood about $90,000 a year. And that's increasing at about 10% a year annually in terms of that inflationary rate. Wow. And the average person who needs it uh, needs care for two and a half years. So you're looking at some of the neighborhood about 250K in today's dollars. Now inflate that for the next 30 years. And, you know, you don't need assisted care in the middle of your life. You need it at the end. So kind of put that out 30 years from now and say, well, what does that, what does that number look like? And it could easily be six, $700,000, you know, at that time. That doesn't mean that between over the next 30 years, that $2 million doesn't double twice either. You know what I mean? Like if you're investing this correctly, that $2 million over 30 years should quite easily become eight, you know, but it's something that you want to consider for sure. Thanks for the question, Ricky. Again, if you've got a question like Ricky's or a different question, well, you know what? <laughs> you probably don't have a question exactly like Ricky's. Now that I even think about that. Stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail gets you there. That's going to do it for today, everybody. Let's uh, pivot over here to the community calendar, what we have going on. Our wonderful team here in Mom's Basement said, and this was at Mom's Urging, she said, you know what, guys? You've got all these money nerds. They don't really know what to get other money nerds for the holidays. You always have talked about these things all year long, these things that either money nerds love or things that are worth the money all year long, you've done this. Why don't you compile those? And we went, duh. And OG and I just kind of looked at each other and went, yeah, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we do that? So we put together our Stacky Benjamins holiday gift guide. If you go to stackybenjamins.com slash gifts, you will see a list of most of the interviews we had this year with, uh, the books that any authors had that came on any movies, documentaries, that you may recommend that people see uh, the board games that we talked about, some of the tools that we've talked about during the shows, and then individual members on our team. I know Doug has talked about some of the most useful gifts that he thinks that people need, which I, I thought were great. Autumn from our social team has them. I've got mine in there. The team is continually adding those. So stackingbedjamins.com slash gifts for the money nerd in your family or the person you want uh, to be a money nerd in your family. Uh, speaking of guides though, here's an even better guide. If you're concerned about the market or the chatter around a recession on the horizon, Ogina's team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. It'll help you plan more and panic less. No matter what the market does, 
So head over to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide and get this helpful free guide from OG and his team at stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. All right, that's going to do it for today. I will be on Instagram later today. So if you want to join me at 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, stop by and say hello. We always have a fun chat on Instagram. That's going to do it for today. Doug, I think you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from John Bow. Want to speak well? Relax, practice the basics, and remember that when in doubt, less is more. Second, if you have an IRA that you're leaving as a legacy, it's best to diversify it based on the needs of the beneficiaries, not your own. Not the big lesson? Okay, look, I really have something to declare. You know what, Doug? It's your moment, baby. Let's do this. It's about time. I've been waiting like this entire episode. You wouldn't let me say what I needed to say. And I've been here. Okay. This is my time. Uh, well, and then the, no, I forgot. You kidding me. Thanks to John Bo for joining us today. His book, I have something to say is available anywhere. They shush you for speaking too loudly. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. This is a time of year, guys, when you're talking to family members far more often and uh, there's some hilarious text streams back and forth. There's an Instagram account, which has a name that we can't say on, <laughs> on, the, on the air. Wow. If you want to, yeah, if you want to write to me, I will, I will give this uh, Put to Put it in the you. 201. But the, these are, these are fantastic. This is a discussion. This is a discussion <laughs> between between two grandchildren. Grandma just flashed me her boob at dinner. She was trying to fix her bra and her whole boob was out on the table. I am mortified. And the other grandchild says, "Ooh, which one?" And the first kid says, "I don't know, the right one." And they go, "No, I'm which grandma?" <laughs> 
This one is horrible. It's between a dad and a daughter. The daughter writes, uh, today was International Women's Day. Why did she send me nice flowers? Dad says, you're not international. You're domestic. I did send flowers to a random woman in Albania. <laughs> oh, between a mom and a son, the son writes, I was walking down my stairs to take Jax out, the dog. I felt something hit the side of my head and then felt what I thought was a bug immediately started hitting myself in the head, trying to kill the thing and was in utter panic flailing around as I tired to get it off of me and murder it. The thing I was trying to kill was, was the drawstring from my hoodie and mom writes in all capitals RWL. And the kid writes real world laughing and mom writes roaring with laughter. My own acronym <laughs> The son goes, mom, you can't just make up abbreviations. You're not texting Shakespeare. She's like, yes, I can. You're not the abrev popo. Um, <laughs> Cheryl does that to me. She's making up like her own abbreviations. I'm like, no, 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 no. I've got, I've got just one more here. I think this is a good one to end on. This is mom writing to daughter. Mom writes, why did you tell your dad and I that WAP stood for wings and pizza? It doesn't stand for that. Very disappointed. We invited our friends out for a WAP night (laughs) thinking it meant wings and pizza. I bet their friends showed up early. (laughs) Or they're never invited back to the church function. (laughs) 